is Dr. Clayton Lane. The topic of this video will be long thoracic nerve palsy and one of its treatments, the pectoralis tendon transfer. What is the long thoracic nerve? Here we see a diagram. The green arrow indicates the long thoracic nerve. You can see that it arises very close to the neck from the brachial plexus here and we can also see the muscle that it innervates, the serratus anterior. The serratus anterior runs from the scapula seen in the back here. It wraps around the chest and has finger-like projections that insert into the rib cage. Well, what's the purpose of the long thoracic nerve? Remember from the rotator cuff talk the scapula accounts for about one-third of shoulder motion. You can see here as the sh shoulder goes through 180 degrees range of motion, the scapula moves about 60 degrees. And the ball of the shoulder stays within one millimeter of the center of the cup throughout that range of motion. And some of that's due to the rotator cuff muscles keeping the ball center, but a large portion of it is the scapula thoracic motion, which you see well here in this diagram. And it's for that reason that many have compared the scapula to a seal balancing a ball on its nose. You can see how the seal has to be in constant motion to keep that ball centered. And that's analogous to the scapula. Well, What happens if it's injured? Here you see a diagram again of uh, the shoulder as the arm is raised. The serratus anterior muscle seen here pulls forward on the scapula allowing the ball to stay centered in the cup but also getting the acromion seen here out of the way so that the humerus can raise. Well here's what happens if the serratus anterior isn't working. You can see how uh, in this diagram the scapula tilted back appropriately as the arm was raised. Here the scapula did not tilt back and you can see that the humerus can only make it up about 120 degrees, 110 degrees before bony impingement occurs uh, on the chromium. Now if you remember from the rotator cuff talk again there is more than just bone here. There's about a centimeter thickness of rotator cuff uh, which is shown in this diagram. So this rotator cuff is going to uh, come into contact with the acromion and become damaged over time as well. How does the long thoracic nerve get injured? The most common cause by far is what's called Parsonage Turner Syndrome. Uh, Parsonage Turner Syndrome is not fully understood. It's really just a catch-all phrase for uh, diseases of the brachial plexus shown here. Now we have been able to link some cases of Parsonage Turner syndrome to viral illness, extreme exercise, and immunization, but for the most part we don't really know what causes Parsonage Turner syndrome. From this diagram it's also easy to see how trauma could cause injury to the long thoracic nerve. A well-placed bullet or knife uh, can damage the long thoracic nerve and there have been reports of that. Additionally, you can see how breast surgery or axillary node dissection, which occurs in this area, could injure the long thoracic nerve as it runs along the chest wall uh, outlined here. And then finally, there's been reported cases of entrapment by the middle scalene muscle or the scalene, uh, excuse me, the scalenus medius. And that muscle is seen uh, just here, right behind the brachial plexus. Here you can see the uh, fibers of the long thoracic nerve coming off the brachial plexus and the uh, middle scalene muscle is right here. So if that muscle becomes hypertrophied or just, just an anatomic variant, it may press on that nerve and cause damage. So how is the long thoracic nerve palsy treated? For the most part, long thoracic nerve palsies will get better on their own. Therefore, it's important to try at least 12 months of activity modification and physical therapy to see if it will get better. At times, if it doesn't get better at six months, an EMG and a nerve conduction study may be helpful to evaluate uh, the long thoracic nerve and see if you can tell where it's entrapped and what type of injury it is. And then possibly a referral to a neurosurgeon for a decompression or a repair would be warranted. If all that fails and you get out to 12 months and the shoulder is still not functioning properly, one option would be to transfer a tendon to replace the serratus anterior which is not working. 
and the most commonly used muscle is the pectoralis muscle. Here you see a diagram of the pectoralis muscle. You can also see in the bottom left here the serratus anterior muscle, uh, the finger-like projections again wrapping around and attaching to the chest wall. Well, the purpose of this procedure is to take a portion of the pectoralis muscle from here and wrap it around the chest wall to replace the function of the serratus anterior which is paralyzed. You can see that a little bit more clearly here as we fold back the pectoralis muscle in this diagram. Again underneath it you see the long thoracic nerve, you see the serratus anterior muscle. You also see over here on the humerus where the pectoralis muscle inserts, you can see the tendon portion of the sternal head of the pectoralis muscle, which is the portion that's going to be used for this tendon transfer. You leave a large majority of the pectoralis muscle intact to continue to function as it always does, and you take this portion to transfer to the scapula. So here you see the uh, skeletal diagram again. This is the insertion of the pectoralis muscle here, and what you're going to do is take a portion of that and transfer it over to the scapula to uh, attempt to hold the scapula to the chest wall during shoulder motion. Again, going back to our diagram of the shoulder in motion, you can see how uh, if by taking the pectoralis muscle from the humerus, wrapping it around the chest wall, if you can attach it to this portion of the scapula, it'll effectively reproduce the motion that you're seeing here. And that's a little bit easier to see in these uh, static diagrams here. If you take the pectoralis muscle from here, connect it to here, then as it contracts it pulls the scapula forward. Again, taking it from here and transferring it to here so that it pours this inferior border of the scapula forward during shoulder motion. Well here's a case of a pectoralis tendon transfer. This is a 17 year old female who presented to my office with progressive loss of shoulder motion. She was diagnosed with long thoracic nerve palsy based on clinical exam which uh, revealed scapular winging which you'll see in a minute which is a fairly obvious uh, diagnostic cue. She attempted physical therapy and observation for several months and was completely non-responsive. Therefore, we had EMG and nerve conduction studies which confirmed the long thoracic nerve palsy. And I referred her over to a neurosurgeon in Houston who's had some great success in decompressing this nerve. However, her surgery to de decompress the long thoracic nerve failed. And as you can see here, she was still struggling with her shoulder motion. She could only lift about 110 degrees or less, and she had severe pain and uh, scapular winging. You can see how the scapula uh, protrudes away from the chest wall. That's uh, what is referred to as scapular winging. So we determined after much debate and discussion to proceed with a pectoralis tendon transfer using a hamstring autograph for reinforcement. Again, here's our diagram of the chest wall, and this is essentially what you're looking at in this picture. We've isolated the sternal head of the pectoralis muscle here with this clamp. The remainder of the pectoralis muscle is behind that clamp and safe from dissection. Now, we couldn't tell from our anatomic diagrams earlier, but uh, we've learned over time that the pectoralis muscle is not nearly long enough to reach around the chest wall and reach to the scapula. Uh, at the site desired. Therefore what we have to do is take the hamstring tendon from her knee and here you can see how I've woven it through the pectoralis tendon in a tried and true fashion which will allow me plenty of length to transfer the tendon around to the scapula. Now I didn't take enough pictures in this case but I can show you uh, a couple of the steps that are to follow. What we're going to do here is tunnel underneath the axilla over to the scapula here. You can see in the background here this specialized shoulder holder. This is called a spider shoulder holder. It allows me to move her arm wherever I want it in space and it will hold it there. So in the next portion of the procedure I'm going to move her arm over her body so that the scapula will come into view and I can really make a very small incision over the scapula, tunnel this tendon and along the chest wall to the scapula, tie it in there, and the case is done. 
So effectively, again, we're moving it from here, tunneling it along the chest wall, and attaching it to the medial, excuse me, the inferior border of the scapula. And here you can see her six weeks after surgery. You may be able to notice that her scapular function is markedly improved, and you can clearly see that her uh, shoulder elevation is 100%. You might even say that her scapula is functioning better than the left, which was the unaffected side. Now, if we compare that to our pre-op video, uh, you'll clearly be able to see um, here again is the post-op at six weeks. And if you compare that to the pre-op scene here, you can see how her shoulder, her scapula is winging. It's not winging in the post-op video. So this was a very successful case of pectoralis tendon transfer. In summary, the causes for long thoracic nerve palsy are largely not understood. Most long thoracic nerve palsies do get better with time and physical therapy. Surgical options for those that don't improve include nerve decompression and muscle transfers. Thank you.